Relative to consumers, I want to talk a little bit about consumer perspective and market responses on certain aspects of antibiotic use in food animals and talk a little bit about what some of the hot button issues are. Really talk about what's at stake relative to Global One Health. Um, what are the questions that consumers really have and how to address those questions? And I am going to go fast. We've talked a lot about Global One Health and I think we all know that, again, we need healthy humans and healthy food and healthy animals to get that done. And if we leave any one of those out, if we leave humans out or we leave animals out of the equation, ultimately we're going to have uh, negative impacts on our overall population. Diseases move back and forth between people and animals. Um, some of them we know which direction they move. Some of them they move mo both directions. There's a lot of them, a lot of areas that we don't have a lot to, uh, a lot of information to know exactly where to land. In addition to this whole idea of One Health, um, world, world production of food, food animals is reduced by about 20% due to diseases creating food security challenges. And that's a really interesting fact when we think about what today is. According to the World Health Organization, the United Nations, today is the day, okay, today is the day when we go from having 6 billion in some people yesterday to 7 billion today. And we've talked about that a lot over the last number of years and what that means between now and 2050, um, but we really need to think hard about how we're going to feed 7 billion people right now and 9.5 billion people over the next 40 years. Huge challenge. and. We need to have good systems and great technology in place to get that done. The challenge, as we've talked to, is how do we preserve the efficacy currently available antimicrobials for use in both people and in animals. It's a complex issue, and as we talked about a few minutes ago, it's often uh, <clears throat> incorrectly simplified or just flat out reported incorrectly, leading to a lot of uh, misconceptions by the public who is, in fact, far removed from the source of food. We've talked a little bit about the Denmark example and what we know, here's the data in terms of tonnage of use over time. What we see on the left hand side over here obviously is when they put the ban in place, the amount of uh, drug usage for therapeutic, or excuse me, for growth applications drops dramatically. Um, at the same time what we see is therapeutic use goes up over the same time. So here we are 10 years later and while if we ask 10 different people how to interpret what we see here, at the end of the day is there's an awful lot of uh, former, former use in the growth area that's now been applied in the therapeutic area and we're continuing to move back to where the sum of total usage is about the same. And I think what that says about growth promotion despite the fact that it's both politically and publicly not highly palatable is from a research standpoint as we continue to look towards phasing out the applications of growth promotants uh, as antibiotics we need to do more research in this area to understand exactly what it is that's happening um, relative to disease that we may not identify but we're obviously controlling in one manner or another. So where does that leave consumers? We've got some major challenges in animal agriculture. Uh, three of them that I talk about a lot, anthropomorphism, pets have changed people's view of animal use. You know, people's comment is you wouldn't treat your dog like that or you wouldn't eat your dog. But if you lived in the Philippines, you might get up and you might eat your dog. And that's just part of their culture there. Okay? Agricultural alienation, we've been talking about it. Uh, people are six generations removed on average from the farm. One of the comments that I remember is milk comes from the grocery store. I had the opportunity to be in Ithaca, New York uh, in about February of 2002. I was there to teach and happened to know the guy who ran one of the grocery stores. There was a major storm coming through and as Jim Carroll will tell you, it's a real challenge for those of us who work in the dairy industry to keep milk on the shelves around known storms in the northern half of the United States during the winter months. You know when they're coming, but you get these tremendous uh, runs on demand. And milk being milk, it's kind of a challenge to keep those stores stocked up. So I walked into the store, and uh, I was just staying at the hotel that was right next door. And I went back and grabbed a sandwich, and I went to get a quart of chocolate milk for dinner. And as I walked over to the milk case, the guy who was the manager of the store who I happen to know because I lived in Ithaca for many years was talking to a woman and the woman said to him, why can't you just go back in the back, in the, back of the store and mix some up? Okay? And he looked at me and he said, Mike, I'm glad you're here. You take this one. <laughs> but I think it's really important to remember that people do care about their system. They care immensely about where their food came from. 
And just because they're uh, far removed from, from having a lot of experience that most of us would have doesn't mean they don't deserve the right to know. Um, so we need to be able to answer those questions. And there's a lot of loss of faith in both science and technology, largely because it's complex to the point where most people can't understand it. So what we need to do in terms of our communication, one thing we need to really focus on is trust and the development of trust. Some of you may have participated earlier this week in the food summit that was going on across the, across the hall. And as we talk to people about, consumers about what it is that they need to consider um, relative to animal agriculture, the first thing we have to establish is trust. Okay? Nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Okay? There's three real components to trust. There's confidence, there's value similarity, and there's, comp uh, there's confidence, which is really built around value similarity. There's competence, which is a technical issue. And then there's influencing others. Uh, if we can accomplish those three things, then ultimately we can have trust. And if consumers trust us, they'll give us the social license to continue to operate uh, using the technologies and tools that we have to ultimately um, <clears throat> feed those 7 billion people that are out there today and continue to work in that direction towards tomorrow. So we need to work in that way very clearly. So what drives consumer trust is really shared values. It's not about our competence or our skills. We need to demonstrate those values. Those values are three to five times more important in building trust than demonstrating competence. So what's on the mind of consumers? I want to give you a little feel for some research that was done at Pfizer, and I'm going to go fast through this. 2,000 non-vegans uh, talked about relative to dairy, beef, and pork. It was a quantitative study. We established baseline feelings about agriculture. So we asked them a bunch of questions before we gave them any information. Then we gave them some information, asked them the same questions, and measured differences in responses. Okay. This is the description, and I'm not going to read it. I just want you to get a feel for the fact that basically what we told them were cows raised by a team of people. Veterinarians are involved. We use vaccines, again, just in case. I don't know where Mike Apley went, but we do use vaccines in the dairy side, too. Um, <clears throat> sometimes animals get sick. We need to treat them well and treat them with antibiotics. They're under the care of licensed veterinarians. If an antibiotic is administered, that food is withhold, withholding times, safety systems, um, extensive testing systems in place to ensure none of that antibiotics, etc., gets into the food system. We have state and government oversight. What we ultimately learned was that consumers are compassionate. Um, despite having no information, over half agree that animals needed to be treated when they're sick. We need, need to use those tools. But about half of them, two-thirds actually, aren't sure that treated animals should go into the food supply. But they also hold views that we've been talking about that antibiotics are used indiscriminately, um, <clears throat> that those antibiotics will end up in the food supply, and that creates a public health threat. And there's the general perception out there that using antibiotics to promote growth is unacceptable. So overcoming those concerns, if we look at the first one, antibiotics are used indiscriminately on the farm with minimal oversight of either the veterinarians or FDAs. That message can be managed simply by telling people that farm animals are under the care of veterinarians and that the FDA is responsible for regulating medicines like antibiotics for animals. It's amazing as you talk to consumers and ask them about that regulatory environment, I think that they, despite the fact that they understand the FDA's role on the human side, I think they think in the world of veterinary medicine and agricultural production that somehow we're mixing a lot of this stuff up in a tub out in the backyard someplace. And that's clearly not the case. We all know that we operate under the same regulatory environment. Positive impact of the veterinarian. Veterinarians are really important. Learning that farm animals are under the care of veterinarians scored highest in improving consumer confidence about meat and dairy. And so at the low end of the scale here, this 9% is, they, they're not confident. Uh, these guys are confident in the blue and the green. And the bottom line through all of these slides that I'm going to start flying through is that we move about 30% of people um, from a mediocre or non-confident position up into a confident position in these top two boxes just with those two slides that I showed you with some really basic information about what we do. So our messages are simple and to the point. Okay? And we've got about 6 to 9% of people throughout this entire study that are very, very, they're basically impossible to move. Um, and that's okay. I think what we've got to remember is we need to focus on the folks in the middle um, the other thing that we learned from this study that's not going to be outlined here 
is that the more highly concentrated an industry, so if we look at dairy versus beef cattle versus pigs, the more highly concentrated, um, <clears throat> the less comfortable people are. And so this group tends to grow up from 6 to 9% up to about 12 to 16% when we look at uh, hog production. Okay? Antibiotics are given to animals end up in the food supply. Simply tell people about this, the uh, safety systems that are in place. Um, <clears throat> creation of resistant pathogens. Because of the complexity of antibiotic resistance that we've been talking about, that's a very difficult one to address in bullets, but facts that helped. Again, a veterinarian's key to ensure correct use of antibiotics. Talk about the regulatory system and the safety system in place relative to the proper and, and the proper handling of food. Antibiotics to promote growth isn't very acceptable, but our interpretation is ultimately that consumers appear open to learning more about how medicines are used on the farm. And when they're given facts about what's being done today, many become much more comfortable with current safeguards and providing adequate protection. Again, we're moving about 30% of that population just with a little bit of information, okay? So the opportunity for all of us is to tell our story and tell it straight up, but keep it simple. <clears throat> Pork safety, you can see a large move from, uh, from left to right here. I'm going to fly through some of this. Government regulations, when we talk about the safety system, they don't know it's in place. Afterwards, we move a huge percentage of people to a confident level about the fact that beef products are safe for my family. General conclusions that providing basing information has a significantly positive uh, impact on consumer attitudes about dairy, especially regarding use of antibiotics to treat sim uh, sick animals and the various protections uh, to help ensure <clears throat> meat safety of meat and dairy products. So our recommendations coming out of that study were to make basic facts available to the food chain. Okay, and I outlined these. They're all in speaker bio or no, someplace in the agenda. I guess they're out there. Animals are under the care of licensed veterinarians. We've talked about veterinary oversight. That's really, really important to consumers, and most of them don't know that. If you just tell people that there are veterinarians involved, and as we continue to push the system to provide more veterinary oversight, that has tremendous impact on consumers' perceptions about the safety of the products uh, that we're putting in their refrigerators. Sick animals should be treated with medicines to restore health. Um, if medicines such as antibiotics are used, we have systems in place to make sure that uh, those that milk and meat is withheld uh, prior to entry into the food system. All milk is tested for antibiotics before it enters the food supply. And again, we need to tell people that vaccines are used to protect animals and prevent various illnesses in the cattle business. Going forward as an industry, we've got opportunities to reinforce by action that medicines are not used indiscriminately. Um, we need to have more veterinary oversight again. There really is no rationale that seems to make the public comfortable about non-therapeutic uses. Uh, and there I'm really talking about growth promotion more than uh, prevention or control. And we need to improve our communication skills on safeguards. As an industry, we all need to be willing to uh, engage the neighbors, engage the folks at church, uh, at coffee hour afterwards, engage the person sitting next to you on the, the plane ride home this afternoon or tomorrow and talk to them about what we're doing in agriculture and talk to them about why it's important. One of the things that's really difficult when we talk about this concept of seven billion people, um, we have a very different food situation here in the United States than we do, do around the world. We have lots of food in the United States. We talked about that a little bit before. That being said, all voices are not equal. Um, and the folks who want to differentiate products and downplay one group of products against the quality of another product that's marketing to a certain degree, but it doesn't do, doesn't do us a whole lot of good in terms of helping to get everybody fed. We've got problems getting people fed here in the United States. 11 million people in the United States went to bed last night and didn't have enough food to eat yesterday. 11 million. 17 percent of households in the United States will be food insecure at some point in the next 12 months. 17% in the United States. 45 million people in the United States right now are receiving some type of food aid. 45 million out of about 310 million. That's more than 10%. Okay? We got plenty of challenges right here at home to get food into people, to get food in people's hands. 
and keep them fed, and that problem only gets magnified as we go outside the U.S. So we've got a huge challenge on our hands, and the great thing is we've got great people working on this all over the world, and uh, I have every confidence that as long as we can tell our story and generate trust with consumers, we will get it done.